Thank you very much. That was just fascinating. So I'm going to ask all of our panelists to come up and um, you know, just take another minute or so to gather your thoughts and write your questions down. Um, we have two additions to our panel. The first is Dr. Wade Baratini. He's the Carl E. Rickles Professor of Psychiatry at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. He also studies the genetics of brain disorders and behavior, um, but these include addiction, mood disorders, eating disorders, and epilepsy. Uh, these diseases are often diagnosed and described by behaviors, uh, but Dr. Berrettini is really looking at the genetic, the substantial genetic underpinnings um, that are involved. Our second addition to the panel is Dr. Robert Schultz. He's a pediatrics professor at the University of Pennsylvania, but he's also the director of the Center for Autism Research at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, um, which, as you've probably noticed, is one of the largest autism research programs in the world. Uh, Dr. Schultz researches the genetics of autism spectrum disorders, and he also uses those neuroimaging techniques, uh, techniques that Dr. Buchan had um, highlighted at the end of her talk. So, um, you know, I was prepared to kick off the discussion with a couple of questions, but I don't need to. These are wonderful, what I've just kind of skimmed through so far, um, and if there are any others, you can bring them up. Um, so we'll start with one, which I thought was a really um, basic question, but I thought it was very, very um, astute because I was asking it myself. Um, so, <clears throat> Dr. Spinner, you had brought up, um, you know, that that the 99.5% of our genomes are similar, but we also hear that chimps are 99% similar to humans. Um, can you help interpret those numbers for us? Um, I don't know if I'm the best person <laughs> to answer the evolutionary questions, but the differences between chimps and humans <clears throat> are different than the differences between people. So some of the differences it, between chimps and humans are more regulatory in nature and have to do with what genes are turned on, maybe with some differences in genes that, that exist in ways that the chromosomes are organized. The organization in humans is more similar one to the next. So there's kind of like a different class of differences between chimps and humans, although again, they're very similar, much more so than we had predicted. Good. Um, and this other question I thought, um, really gets to some of the ethical issues that came up um, in several of the talks about, you know, when we get this information, a lot of these screens are done post hoc. The kids have the illness already and we're trying to understand what's behind it and maybe, you know, how to treat it. Um, what are some of the ethical considerations for prenatal screening, um, for IVF, and, you know, how do you deal with that as researchers and then as clinicians as well? Um, I'm sure many of you probably have thoughts. Um, Dr. Buchan, do you want to start? Um, so, um, I, first of all, I have to say I'm a geneticist, and I'm extremely, extremely fortunate that I work at Penn, where we have many genetic counselors. So, in my own work, I work only with de-identified individuals. So we have DNA, when I mentioned to you uh, autism genetic research, it's changed. We have DNA and a number attached to these uh, DNA samples. Uh, and there is a strict distinction between research where we still have to follow very important ethical issues and then um, uh, clinical settings that uh, Nancy Spinner presented where genetic counselors are discussing risk and consequences with families. So maybe Nancy wants yeah, to add I something. Can address, I can address this a little bit. So as this new testing has come on board and as labs like mine have been working and seeing what we can see, we recognize that this is not information that most people want to have for an unborn child. So this is recognized universally. There are currently some large NIH collaborative studies that are going on to ask exactly this question. You don't have to look at the whole genome. The window that we have right now is spectacular and we can see a lot. I think most people agree you don't want to see all of that in a prenatal screen. You want to only have information that you can use in a positive way. And there are actually trials that are going on now to look at what's the best amount of information and how should this be done. So there are some, there's a, there's a group from the NIH called LC, which stands for the Ethical, Legal, and Societal Implications of Genetic Testing. 
and it's part of the uh, NHGRI, the National Human Genome Research Institute, and there are several groups, including one at Penn that I'm a part of, that are involved in looking at the impact of this kind of testing and starting to think about it. So it's a work in progress, but it does not go unnoticed that these are huge questions for human biology. Um, Dr. Bonini, we have a question for you about, and this could be a question that could be about any type of model for human disease, whether it's mouse, drosophila, yeast, as you had mentioned. How do you actually get the human disease gene into the animal? Yeah, so there are very um, powerful techniques to just take the human gene and jump it right into the fly. So this is uses some these so-called jumping genes, these transposable elements that Barbara McClintock had originally gotten a Nobel Prize for. And so you can make these kinds of organisms by just putting the gene in. So it's actually a very simple technique that was, um, that was worked out and made. And as you can see, it's a very powerful technique. Good. Um, I have a question here about the DSM, which is the Manual for Diagnosing. Um, behavioral disorders, and you're the MD on the panel here, so I thought I would direct this to you, Dr. Berrettini, um, or anyone else who would like to answer it. I think Dr. Buchan may have an opinion as well. Um, so there, there's this big change happening in the DSMs, going from DSM-4 to DSM-5. Um, this is, you know, years and years in, in the making. Um, so how would, you know, this change to the DSM-5 be beneficial to genetics re genetic genetic researchers um, and or scientific clarity? Well, um, this diagnostic and statistical manual is um, revised every maybe five to ten years um, by groups of uh, psychiatrists who um, try to define limits of behavioral disorders. Its primary use um, is not in research thank goodness, mm -hmm. um, because it's not written with much biology um, in mind. It, um, and that's because the biology of most of these illnesses remains uh, unknown. But um, we do have um, a, a couple of advantages uh, by using this instrument. One is it provides a framework for clinicians to provide diagnoses um, really descriptions of signs and symptoms of disease. Uh, and two, it, it um, is used widely, uh, uh, not only in the United States, but around the world um, uh, for insurance reimbursement and, and health care finances. Um, so it provides us with, um, let's say, a common language, if you will, to understand the remarkable spectrum of human behavioral disorders. This latest um, revision of the document uh, is occurring at a time when we are just beginning to discover um, the common and rare uh, genetic variants that predispose individuals um, to these types of diseases. A as you heard in um, Dr. Nancy Spinner's talk, um, a deletion in, on chromosome one has been um, uh, a, a identified as a rare cause of something we, we call schizophrenia, a chronic psychotic illness. And as we define um, the genetic predispositions to these mental disorders, um, they will appear in this document, although at the present time, for the current revision, nobody does expect them to appear in the diagnostic document. Did you have something more to add, Dr. Schultz? You're the psychologist on the panel here. So I just want to reiterate some of the things that Dr. Barantini said, um, which would first, I mean, the purpose of classification is really communication, so that you can kind of encapsulate in, in a single word a whole litany of meanings. So when you say autism, you know, you, that automatically <clears throat> cues you to a, a number of different signs and symptoms. Um, for autism, there is a change in the DSM where right now, um, based on behaviors, we, we think we have subtypes such as autism and Asperger, and then this what we call a sub-syndromal category known as PDD-NOS, Pervasive De Developmental Disorder uh, NOS. Um, but the biology has taught us over the last 15 years since Asperger was first introduced into the DSM-4 that, that there really, there's not much validity to these subtypes. We, we've been unable to find um, differences either in genetic risk 
or in uh, predicting treatment response or in anything to do with um, brain imaging. So actually, um, DSM-5 is going to, uh, in some sense, regress and, and, and throw up its hands and say, if we can't have valid subtypes, we're probably better off not having any subtypes at this point, and we're going to have a single disorder known as autism spectrum disorder. Um, and, and that's the way scientists have been approaching it anyway for the last decade. Certainly all of our genetic studies, our imaging studies, um, we have been grouping them all together. And Dr. Buchan. Yeah, I would like to uh, share with you two personal stories related to uh, this issue of Asperger and autism spectrum disorder. I had uh, several graduate students who came to me who have Asperger. They are extremely, extremely intelligent and they are aware that they have some social impairment, but they handle that and they go normally through life. And they came to me to ask me to comment and they did not want to be under the same umbrella and they did not want to have it called autism spectrum disorder. On the other hand, uh, my nephew was diagnosed with Asperger a year ago, and although we were very careful not to use autism word in the family, within weeks, entire family realized that once when you go on the web and you start reading and when you go to the school, you actually realize that this is a spectrum and that many services that are available for autism spectrum disorder are going to be available to them. So it's really going to, we'll have a lot of discussions pro and against. I want to ask another question about autism um, because the, the nature of this question really broadens it out too. We've been focused so much on genetics obviously, we're here for the Penn Genome Frontiers Institute. Um, but. This person is asking, and maybe Dr. Schultz, I'll, I'll pass this to you first, why is there an increase in diagnosis of autism and could there be environmental factors? And I think we can ask this of, of Dr. Spinner and Dr. Bonini as well about, you know, we're looking, we're talking about the genetics, but how do we also measure the environmental impact on all these diseases that we've heard about tonight? Right. So first to you. So, so the increase in autism really is a puzzle to most of us. We, we don't really have a firm answer. Uh, we have hints that some of it is due to better recognition. Uh, certainly, a lot of the increase is in the more milder forms. So kids who may not have been diagnosed 20 years ago, they may have gone unlabeled. We're now labeling, so we're, we're seeing an increase in prevalence because we're kind of widening the circle. Um, there's also um, some evidence of what we call diagnostic swapping. Uh, in, in many situations, the, the label of an autism or an ASD uh, provides you more services. It, it's a, it's, it opens more doors, like in your school setting. Um, and so you can see evidence of uh, in certain situations, a, a child who might have been diagnosed uh, with something like mental retardation uh, suddenly is being diagnosed with ASD. And it doesn't mean that it's inaccurate. It doesn't mean that it's fraudulent. It just means that uh, that other diagnosis might have seemed um, more frightening to the families in and, and, and many ways that they would have preferred that diagnosis in the past, but now it's a key to services and so it's opened. But that doesn't explain it all. So we really uh, are at a bit of a loss to explain the increase, uh, but that explains probably some big chunks of it. Uh, going back to Dr. Buchan's talk where she talked about the concordance rate uh, between twins, uh, the clearest evidence that it's not all genetic is, is the, the lack of perfect concordance amongst people who are perfectly genetically identical. So the concordance rates for identical twins are around 80 or 90 percent, so we know there's an environmental component. Um, it's, it's, in my mind, probably something that's harder to study. Uh, there, there's no obvious environmental contributions that have been identified for autism at the moment. There are um, you know, s uh, studies here and there which pinpoint perhaps certain exposures in the environment, um, but as of yet, there isn't that consistent body of, of evidence to, to really uh, uh, give us kind of a smoking gun and to make us excited in the scientific sense that we, we may have a handle on one of these. So at the moment, we are a little bit further ahead in understanding the genetics. We know that it's heritable. We, we actually know the uh, genes involved in 10 or 15 percent, and, and those have been replicable findings. On the environmental side, we know that it, it, it contributes. It contributes less on average, um, but we don't really know uh, what those sources of influence are. And Dr. Berrettini, what about some of the diseases you work on that often have environmental triggers? Um, you know, I think of you know, mood disorders and eating disorders. Um, what about the environmental role of those types of disorders as well as the genetics? Uh, well, uh, 
for example, um, bipolar illness. This is also known as um, manic depressive illness. It is a disorder with substantial uh, inherited components. It's been estimated that the heritability, that fraction of risk attributable to genetics is somewhere between, say, 60 and 80 percent. So that leaves room for an enormous environmental component. Um, we do understand a, a few of the uh, likely environmental triggers um, that are antecedent um, to the um, development of the illness in some individuals. Uh, for example, um, a period of uh, drug or alcohol uh, use, particularly um, intense abuse, can occur uh, prior to the first episode of depression or mania. Um, some experts debate whether this is indeed the first sign of illness in those individuals. Um, oftentimes, we can see that exposure to a particular therapeutic medicine um, can initiate um, the first episode of illness. Um, frequently, this is um, a steroid. Um, uh, steroids are very useful medicines for all kinds of illnesses. Um, unfortunately, when these large doses of steroids are given briefly to a person who's, let's say, um, susceptible to bipolar illness, it can be the environmental trigger that uh, initiates the first episode uh, of this recurrent disorder. So I would like to point out, actually, that um, in human degenerative disease, in particular one of the diseases, Parkinson's disease, there's strong epidemiological evidence that exposure to like pesticides um, can, um, or herbicides seem to promote the disease. And we can actually incorporate that into our genetic models in flies. So we can take flies and now expose them to things like paraquat and rotenone. You can even expose flies to alcohol, okay, and make them alcoholics. Um, so you can incorporate this really important component of human disease right into the genetics of a simple system. And I think that that's a really important component of these systems that really has ties to the human situation that can be exploited more. Dr. Spinner, I want to direct a few questions to you. One is a real quick and simple easy one, and one is a lot more difficult. The, the easy one is, um, how is the genomic testing done? Where on the body? How, how is it collected? OK, so we, we do it. <coughs> excuse me. Whoa. <laughs> we need a small sample of DNA, and the easiest place to get that is we get it from blood. So we would get a small two mils to like a teaspoon kind of of blood, and from that we can extract the DNA. And once we have the DNA, we can actually, it's called genotyping. We send it through these big machines, which is actually done at the Center for Applied Genomics. But we just need a little bit of blood. And the more difficult question, which um, I'm guessing you know more than just Dr. Spinner would like to weigh in on it, is about the therapies for these types of illnesses. So especially for single gene therapies, um, you know, where are we in trying to correct them? Where are we in terms of gene therapy when we know particularly what to target? Um, so I'm sure it's not an so easy I'll, one to answer. But. I'll, I'll, I'll start, <laughs> but I know that some of my colleagues will have something to say. So we're actually, gene therapy has been a field that's been followed for many years full of promise, and I think it's been disappointing to many people in the field. We thought that once we had the genes, starting in the, really in the early 90s, as disease genes started to be identified quickly, we thought we would be able to replace those disease genes. I'm sure some of, in the audience are familiar with some of the spectacular failures um, and disappointments and um, problems for patients that have, that have come up. So we are now in a, in a new phase. I think last year, possibly at this talk, you, there was a little bit of mention of um, some work that's being done on blindness at Penn. So there has been some incredible success from Jean Bennett and Kathy High, who have been working with a specific form of blindness, where they're able to introduce um, a, a cure for that that has now started working. There are several other genetic disorders. Um, a good one is Marfan syndrome. This is a disorder caused by mutations in a protein called fibrillin, and patients get aortic aneurysms because the walls of their, their aortas aren't, are not strong enough, and so they actually can break open, causing, um, causing death, causing early death. 
and because of the genetics, the, the uh, investigators who have studied that learned that there were some basic signaling pathways going awry, and there are actually clinical trials now happening where if you treat with certain drugs that target those signaling pathways, they are able to prevent those aortic aneurysms from happening. And there are several other, maybe Nancy wants to talk a little bit about Fragile X syndrome, another genetic disorder, which has been modeled in flies, some work done at Penn and elsewhere. They've uh, understood the synaptic pathway that's involved, and there are now some trials that are going on to see this affects mental retardation, something nobody thought we could even think about, and there are new approaches being developed. So I think it's slower than some of us would have liked. Um, we were hoping there would be more at this point, but I think there are starting to be some successes now, and the field is excited, and we always think we, we are aware that we just need one or two breakthroughs and the way some of these things are done, that's going to lead to a new spate of therapies. So it, it, it's, there is potential with a few recent successes. Um, it, there's perhaps the most successful gene therapy um, in a, a pediatric disease is for sickle cell anemia. Um, it, curiously enough, the, there, are, there are other uh, genes in the body that can produce uh, fetal hemoglobin. And fetal hemoglobin is unaffected in sickle cell hemoglobin, cause the, in sickle cell disease, because it's the adult form of hemoglobin that is uh, where the mutation occurs. Um, the fetal hemoglobin gene is turned on, uh, as you might imagine, in embryonic life and uh, is gradually turned off um, during the first two years of life. And that's why children with sickle cell anemia are oftentimes a year old before their um, diagnosis is made. Um, and hydroxyurea is a, um, a simple treatment for um, a sickle cell disease, which can keep the fetal hemoglobin gene turned on. And so spare the individual uh, some of the ravages of that disease. And so that's probably the first and most successful um, form of gene therapy um, it, for uh, a pediatric disease. Um, and keeping on the same topic, someone had asked about HSP70 and if there's something in humans that could um, restore the function. So um, humans have an HSP70 and actually, that sort of finding of HSP-70 sort of um, stimulated an entire um, set of researchers. There's many, many people who study what are called the molecular chaperones, which was classically discovered in the stress response being heat shock. That's why they originally called that. But actually, that entire field has really directed itself towards the idea of how can we activate these genes in various situations by using drugs and which chaperones are important at different times. So that's been a really great stimulator of that field and is another sort of way about how cross-fertilization of ideas can really help jumpstart fields into different areas. Um, Dr. Buchan, I know this is um, work of yours. Someone asks, is there an animal model for autism spectrum disorders? And if so, where and who is using it? Uh, that's a great question, very close to my heart. This is basically how I entered the field of autism. So right now, although I'm not trying to model uh, autism in the mouse, we have very um, several uh, colleagues uh, here at Penn who are trying to do it, and not only at Penn, across the country. So the important aspect that I have to say is that we are aware that when we work with model organisms such as the mouse, we can generate single gene mutations, while autism is, as I said, multifactorial, polygenic. So in modeling autism, we are not trying to get what I like to say autistic mouse. We know that the best way to get good models is to actually define particular components. Of course, we will not be able to work anything, uh, create or model language problems. On the other hand, in terms of social interaction, that is component that can be modeled. So there are single gene uh, mutations in the mouse. Uh, and not only in the mouse, but also in flies and C. elegans that specifically um, disrupt social interaction. 
and this is basically done uh, using a very interesting setup where, for instance, mice are placed in the cage with three compartments, and in two compartments on the side are mice. Or on one compartment on the side is a mouse, other compartment is empty. In the middle compartment, we place a mouse and then monitor using cameras whether mice have a tendency to go and spend time in the compartment with another mouse or they are just completely indifferent or lean towards the compartment that is empty. But there is a lot of work done in this area. Um, so this was a um, big topic of conversation at the last event that we had here, and that was epigenomics. So um, you're nodding, Dr. Spinner, so I'll toss it to you. Um, what is epigenomics, and could it explain variable expressivity? That's a, that's a good question. We were just discussing this this morning. So epigenomics is, so I, I talked about, and the, you know, the facts of DNA are that you start out with a sequence, and it's G-A-T-C, G-A-C, and it's pretty much, aside from errors that happen, you have your sequence, and, and there it is, and that's kind of built into everything. <clears throat> but epigenomics is when there are modifications on top of the DNA, that where there are chemical groups that come in and stick to the DNA. We call them genomic marks. And the presence of these genomic marks might shut down a gene that's there. And exactly how these change over the course of a lifetime is not completely known. There have been now been some studies on identical twins where you can look at the epigenetic marks, so the chemical modifications of twins as they age, and in fact, they get different because they are living different lives even though they have the same genetic material. So epigenomics can account for a lot. We don't yet understand it. I think just as you heard from some of the answers before, we're geneticists sitting here, so we're, we're, we're sort of all about the tools for genetics. Some of the ways that the environment can modify the epigenetics is, I think, a fascinating place that we're all starting to think about. In fact, we had a brainstorming session for a next grant that we want to write, and we realize we have to incorporate it, because one of the questions we want to address is what's causing the variable expressivity. So there are now new tools where you can look at the epigenetics and ask, what are the differences? Let's take somebody with mild disease and severe disease and look at their epigenomics across this region and see, are there clear and consistent differences? So I think this is a very hot area. New tools have emerged, and it is going to be very important. I know all of you are a geneticist, but there are a couple policy questions here, so I'm not sure who wants to take this. but. Um, this person asks, what safeguards are or will be in place to prevent governments or insurance from using my DNA against me and discriminating against me? So is anyone familiar with Gina? A little bit. A little bit. Yeah. So, so Gina is, yeah. is a new Genetic Non-Discrimination Act that was recently passed. Um, there are certainly some lobbying groups for genetic organizations. There are groups of individuals who have genetic disorders and rare genetic disorders. And this has been a huge and enormous concern. And I think this is one of the things that has everybody very anxious about the Genome Project. If you can know your genome at birth, some people would argue, since we all have something in our genomes, that nobody's going to be able to get insurance. So we, we know that's not going to exactly happen, but people are very worried about it. So I think that there are lobbying groups right now who are trying to address this and make sure that that doesn't happen. There was this year a law passed, I think it was this year or maybe last year, this Genetic Non-Discrimination Act, that's um, the acronym for it is GINA. So again, these are things that the policy field has gotten much bigger. So people like myself who never thought about policy are now interacting with people thinking a lot about policy. And I think they're, they're, people are going through to great lengths to make sure that this doesn't happen. And if we're really going to have our blueprints sitting out in front of us, then it's going to be very difficult to think how the insurance companies are going to use it. But in a way, it levels the playing field a little bit because so many people will have things. So it's, it's of concern, but in, in some very basic ways, and it's being addressed. And one thing the Act is intended to do is really address employment discrimination in that way. Um. Thank you. So um, this, I'm not sure who would like to answer this, um, 
do certain variations in genes always predict an inevitability that you will get a specific disease? Can a person alter this prediction with preventive measures? Dr. Berrettini, do you want to take it, or Dr. Bonini? Well, there are uh, certain um, mutations that appear 100% uh, of the time to produce um, the disease in question. Uh, fortunately, those are rare. Um, and uh, perhaps the most common uh, such mutation is um, in a gene that causes cystic fibrosis where uh, defects in the gene are present in about one out of every 400 people. Um, Carrier state? Yes. No, more in Caucasians, about one in 40. OK. Um, it, in, it is, so these um, variations are, it tend to be rare because the people who get the diseases um, uh, tend not to be able to reproduce. Um, it, in the case of many of these diseases, um, although we know the exact gene involved, um, the development of treatments based upon the genetic information has been much slower than we previously hoped. Um, one example is um, that uh, Nancy Benini mentioned is uh, Huntington's disease. That gene was identified um, probably more than 15 years ago and we're still trying to develop um, treatments for it. And it, it. One of the inhibitory mechanisms is that because these diseases are relatively uncommon, um, it is um, difficult for a pharmaceutical firm to invest billions of dollars in development of treatment because there's no way that the investment can be recouped given the rarity of the condition. Yes, go ahead. I get to use an analogy that occurred to me while I was working on my talk today. So I pictured that the human genome in some cases, and first let me just say that, that Wade is exactly correct, that there are some diseases that have complete penetrance. You have the <clears throat> mutation, you're getting the disease. Unless we know how to cure it, that's it. There are some diseases that are incompletely penetrant and some diseases with highly variable expressivity. Some people have it bad and some people have it mild and we're not sure exactly why. So I kind of pictured that, you know, when you're born we have this blueprint, if you think of our DNA as a blueprint. So I thought about, if you think of a blueprint like for a city, you know, when you looked at the construction plans for a city, and you could look at those plans if you were an architect and if you knew something about earthquakes, for example, you might look at how these buildings were built and you would say, this is going to be horrible. If there's an earthquake, every one of these buildings is going to fall. So if you had those blueprints but there were no earthquakes, you might go through your life and at the end of the, your life you'd see those buildings were still standing there. If those buildings were in Haiti last year or earlier this year, they would have all crumbled. So you can have a faulty plan, but you may or may not have the problems. And this is, I think, the way we think about some chances for having, you may have a gene that predisposes you to diabetes or cardiac disease. And in the presence of certain other factors that get brought on by lifestyle or diet, you are going to get these disorders. So I think there's a spectrum. I don't think there's one way to look at this, but there are definitely many diseases where you have a susceptibility and if you're lucky enough, you know, you might, have a ten, you might have a weak vessel where you'll have an aneurysm if you're in a car accident. But if you're never in a car accident, you may not know about that. So there are all sorts of things like that, I think, that we're just starting to learn about and understand. And is it related to the, to the body's sort of redundancy systems or its ability to rescue loss or something? Or, how, you know, how do we characterize which ones are all the buildings fall down versus some of them will maybe... This is, this is an area, this is a big area mm -hmm. right now. So mm -hmm. these complexities, you know, if you follow the path of genetics, the diseases that we've all studied first are the ones that were pretty simple. You know, we really knew who was affected and who wasn't affected. You could look at the pedigrees like, like Maya showed you earlier and, you know, you knew that here was how they were moving through families. The, it's much harder when you're not really sure who's affected. You know, if I carry the susceptibility gene but I'm not sick, it's hard to know that and it's much harder to study. So it's only now that we're really starting to address all of those questions. Um, Dr. Schultz, this is about the um, data of the 
um, prevalence of autism, is the rate of reoccurrence of autism in siblings skewed by decisions of parents to not have more kids after having one child with autism? So that's a phenomenon that's been called stoppage, where if you have a, a, a child who has any kind of problem, um, you, you might then not want to have other kids. Um, so in principle, that could skew the prevalence data for those cases where there's going to be a multiplex family. As Maya mentioned in her talk, though, most of families with autism only have a single case. Um, so to the extent that stoppage is you know, decreasing the number of affected cases, it, it probably isn't a, a big cause uh, of affecting the prevalence. All right, very good. Probably have time for just about one more question. Um, and there's another policy one in here, but it's very timely with the recent passage of the health care bill. And this person asks, what should be the role of genomics in the new health care reform program in terms of, one, improving quality of care, and two, controlling health care costs? I'm sure you have to write this all into your grants when you apply for um, research, you know, how this would be applied in practice. Um, Dr. Buchan, do you have any thoughts? Um, in my view, you know, it's very hard to um, answer that question because we are, genomics is changing the way or will be changing the way um, medicine is going to be done. So maybe on one hand, I have a tendency to say um, that there will not be immediate uh, changes. On the other hand, it is very, very likely that within uh, two or three years, uh, looking at the genotype is going to be the first test that's going to be done, not only for pediatric disorders that Tensi talked about, but maybe for many, many complex disorders. So um, maybe uh, giving opportunity through a universal healthcare bill for a large, large number of individuals to have such a test is going to make a major, major change. And it's really going to be part of just everyday medical evaluation. Right. So I would ask Wade. For such questions, <laughs> I would always turn to Wade because he was my first door neighbor for years, physician. Um, uh, in the immediate future, say the next um, decade or two, um, I don't foresee a large role for uh, a genomics in the physician's approach to uh, common diseases like hypertension or diabetes, um, in particular because we have discovered, much to our disappointment, that there are no um, single common alleles that have marked effects on increase for risk for the common type 2 adult onset diabetes or hypertension. So that for the standard common diseases, uh, it, perhaps in the immediate future, genomics will not be applied in a large scale. H however, I, I do see that um, in partial answer to this question, that uh, genomics will uh, eventually result in a, in a marked increase in efficiency with which um, uh, medicine is practiced. And I, I think there'll be better diagnosis and better treatment because of it. Um, however, this is not going to be, say, um, in the immediate future. All right. Um, I just want to end with um, your final thoughts. So maybe if you could just give us kind of the 30-second um, prediction, and we won't hold you to it, but just to tease the audience and myself a little bit, what do you think is going to be the next best greatest thing to come out of your lab? And if you're not feeling comfortable talking about that, maybe in your field at least. So we'll just work down the, down the row. So Dr. Bonini, we'll start with you. So I would say our, our work is focusing towards common now, commonalities between different diseases that I think people never guessed there would be commonalities. So um, that's really sort of where we're going and where we're going after defining these sort of key genes that might be underlying a broad range of degenerative diseases. So w w an example that has been brought up before is um, the fact that we understand a lot about what causes Fragile X now, 
uh, and it's known as the M glu R theory of fragile X. And it's a specific biological pathway which affects the way neurons communicate within the brain at the synapse. Um, and it was mentioned here, there's work done at Penn, on Drosophila, there's work done in mice, which shows that you can actually intervene to correct the, the, the deficient protein and effectively, in many regards, reverse the phenotype uh, in Fragile X. Um, some of those phenotypes include an excessive growth of, of synaptic processes as these neurons want to talk to each other. Um, a third of the kids with Fragile X actually have autism. And so this m theory theory of, of, uh, uh, of Fragile X and the treatments which have arisen in animals, and now they're being translated into clinical trials in, in both uh, Fragile X and in autism, gives us a lot of hope in the field of autism uh, that if you can understand the genetic mechanism and you can understand the biology, and ho hopefully you're lucky and, and there's a way to intervene in the biology, that there will be treatments which are radical. Uh, in the animal models for Fragile X, they're really radical changes in the outcome. So I always like when I talk to parents to, to tell them that it's quite possible that through a fundamental understanding of the biology that there really could be radical changes to how we understand the disorder and to how the treatments occur. And that it's likely that it won't always be or only be a medication, but it's, um, I think of autism as, as, a, as a problem of learning and, and learning within the social context. And so it might be the most effective treatments in the next five or ten years are combinations of drugs uh, which help um, correct a, a native problem in the biology, but in combination with environmental input or, or, or intensive behavioral treatments. So we will know this spring about some of these uh, clinical trials in Fragile X, and so I think that'll be really important to hear, uh, actually, in about a month. Uh, we'll, we'll know whether they're successful, and I think it really could be a really good omen for the field of autism. So our car Keep doing that. <laughs> Our current focus is on understanding variable expressivity. And we work on a couple of different di diseases, allergial syndromes, one of them. And I think to really, for, for, the, for society at large, to feel really comfortable taking action for genetic disorders, we really need to understand when someone's diagnosed with something what their course is going to be like. So we're hoping we will make some inroads into that. So one of the projects uh, in which we're involved is um, the genetics of nicotine addiction. Uh, unfortunately, despite 40 years of government advertising about the dangers of smoking, um, uh, nicotine addiction remains the single largest preventable cause of morbidity and mortality in the United States. Uh, we've had some success in identifying um, a, a um, uh, a DNA sequence which changes the amino acids in a particular nicotinic receptor gene. And uh, I'm very pleased um, to see that um, the National Institutes of Health have issued on the basis of this a call for proposals to develop new medicines which interact with the uh, different forms of this receptor. And I'm particularly excited because much to our surprise, the same DNA sequence that increases risk for nicotine addiction is found to increase risk for lung cancer. And so uh, we are pleased with the idea that we can develop a drug perhaps for nicotine addiction that will be effective in the treatment of lung cancer as well. So in uh, my own study, there is always emphasis on family-based approach. So I showed you in my talk this huge, large case control studies with many uh, unrelated individuals. In my view, um, continuing with families, uh, family-based approach is going to be extremely important because from studies that we presented here, there are so many rare mutations, and the only way to see what is the consequence of these rare mutations is by seeing the same rare mutation in several individuals, and then getting much, much more in-depth phenotypic characterization on many family members, not just focusing at one disease, but take into account interactions between different diseases, and that will be also very important for treatment. So it's, that's where this word personalized is coming from, personalized medicine. 
Good. Thank you. I'll be sure to follow up for um, interviews when I do these stories. <laughs> um, thank you very much for the wonderful conversation, for the outstanding questions, um, and also to the Franklin and uh, the Penn Genome Frontiers Institute. Um, the co-director, Jim Everwine, would like to close with a few words. Thank you. I hope you, like me, enjoyed the conversations today from our speakers and from our panelists. But what I'd like to emphasize is that this is just the tip of the iceberg. We're entering, as Dr. Buchan mentioned, into a golden age of gene discovery and disease understanding based upon genomics applications um, to the study of these diseases. It's not just work of people at Penn. It's work of many others at Penn, but also people at Jefferson, Drexel, Fox Chase, all medical schools and most universities around the world where investigators are dedicating their time and effort to trying to understand these illnesses through these types of genomics approaches. But how did we get here? How did we go from the time of Joshua Lederberg when he first discovered that DNA was a genetic material 65 years ago to the work of Peter Knoll 50 years ago in the discovery of the Philadelphia chromosome, which was the first genomic disease and, and one of the causes of cancer, to these machines that Dr. Kim mentioned in his introductory remarks that will sequence 85,000 letters, I'm sorry, 85 billion letters in one day. Um, aside from the very hard and ded dedicated work of the scientists involved with this, um, we've had to have funding for these efforts. Much of the funding for these efforts has come from the National Institute of Health. National Institute of Health is NIH, and it's a government entity that was started at the end of the 19th century that became a national institute in the 1940s, and over 90 percent of research in the United States, health-related research, is funded by the NIH. Our new director of the NIH is Francis Collins, and his number one priority when he uh, became director a few months ago was to promote genomics and its application to translational medicine. And the idea is that with knowledge of the sequences that are associated with human diseases and the SNPs that have been discussed today, and the fundamental science, the basic science that goes into trying to understand how those might be evolved in disease etiology, the knowledge will come. From that knowledge always comes hope, hope for disease therapeutics, hope for disease cures. And it's through initiatives at NIH that these hopes will be realized. So I'd like to encourage all of you to write to your representatives and to Senator Specter to try to make sure that the NIH budget is increased so that these efforts can continue and hopefully be enhanced over the next several years. On behalf of Jun Young and myself, we'd like to thank Karen Elenick and Frederick Bertley, who worked on behalf of the Franklin Institute to co-sponsor this event with us. We've worked with them on two other occasions, and we love the interactions with them, and, and, and the synergy has been phenomenal. We'd like to thank Carrie Grenz for her very able moderation of this and the last event. We'd like to thank Kristen Fields of the Penn Genome Frontiers Institute for her very able organization of, of this event, and, and Kristen has been a godsend for all of us involved in these programs. And of course, we'd like to thank the speakers and panelists for their enlightening presentations and discussion. Finally, we'd really like to thank all of you for braving the weather and joining us today, and we look forward to you joining us for our next event, which we hope will be in about six to seven months. Thank you again. <laughs>